War. War never changes. Except for when you add 60 foot tall robots, then it gets a whole lot cooler. Hey everyone, it's Redcon, and I wanted to talk about something that is near and dear to my heart. Gundam. Uh, the one from 1979, and maybe a couple of the other ones too, there are like 35 of them at this point. We'll see how things go. So let's get into it. This is the original Mobile Suit Gundam. In order to enjoy the original Mobile Suit Gundam for what it's worth, we have to turn back the clock all the way to 1972. Former members of the animation studio Mushi Productions strike out on their own and form Sunrise Studio, a company that would go on to become one of the most influential in not only the arena of anime, but also in the world of toys. They didn't waste any time partnering with Bandai to produce many, many toys revolving around their shows. That's right, straight out of the gate, Sunrise saw opportunity in marketing and in volume. See, the company operated a little differently than a lot of the other production houses at the time. Instead of revolving around one creative head like Mushi Productions did, Sunrise split into multiple studios only a few years after forming. This meant that by the time Mobile Suit Gundam was in production in 1979, Sunrise had already had five separate studios at the company and had produced 15 anime series, which is quite an accomplishment for a company's entire lifespan, to be honest. So, in its seven years of existence, Sunrise became a very experienced company, with multiple teams working under its name and all working on different projects. But I wonder if anyone at the company realized that they would release a show that would revolutionize an entire genre of animation and become a cultural cornerstone. Enter Tomino Yoshiyuki, the creator of the long-running Gundam series. Tomino was no novice when he created Gundam. In fact, he had already directed four full-length anime series and had started his career as a screenwriter and storyboardist at Mushi Production. He was given creative control of a team and set out to make a new kind of mecha anime. Before Mobile Suit Gundam, most mecha anime had its background in superhero-style giant robots that were mystical or alien in origin. Think Ultraman, or even Astro Boy, technically. The robots in these series were usually piloted by a small child remotely somehow, and most of the time they fought with giant monsters. Tomino had a different idea. The mechs in Mobile Suit Gundam were more akin to vehicles, huge, hulking, bipedal tanks piloted by military personnel. These were weapons of war, and right from the start of Mobile Suit Gundam, they feel like it. I mean, the first episode features civilians getting absolutely wrecked by a one-shot from a mobile suit. Gundam was more serious from the start, adopting genuinely dark themes that resonate even to this day. When asked what he wanted to accomplish in an interview with An America Magazine, Tomino had this to say. The bottom line is, I wanted to have a more realistic robot series. Unlike a super robot, where everything is more reality based. So the whole idea, my idea, of trying to have a robot series in space without it becoming a stupid story, was based on wanting to make a story and surrounding it with reality. More realistic possibilities was the underlying concept. And there you have it, he wanted to make a realistic war story without it becoming stupid. Now that is a concept I can get behind. You can see this influence present in the fact that in Gundam, the robots actually need to be piloted, meaning that destroying an enemy mobile suit in combat caused death. The action had meaning, characters we like are inside the robots now, not just controlling them from the sidelines, they're taking actual risks. The show was different in a lot of ways, and as the start of the most prolific mecha anime ever created, it must have been massive in Japan when it released, right? Well, no, not really. In fact, Mobile Suit Gundam kind of flopped pretty hard. The show premiered to subpar ratings and general lukewarm reception upon release, with the animation being called dated and the show's sometimes slow pacing called into question. The original run was cut from a full 52 episodes to 43 episodes, and the ending was altered so the team could finish under the new constraints. And for a little bit, it seemed like that would be that. Tomino's mature war drama space opera would fade away into the annals of history, sitting in Sunrise's backlog awaiting a very expensive Blu-ray release. 
But then, Bandai obtained the rights to produce the first Gundam model kit. Their very first Gunpla, the RX-78 Gundam, was released onto Japanese shelves in the July of 1980, seven months after the show had ended its run on television. Kids loved it. People couldn't get enough. Almost every mobile suit from the original show was released as a model kit by 1984. The renewed interest in the toys brought demand for reruns of the original show, and the rest is history. That's right, Mobile Suit Gundam was saved in syndication, and a trilogy of compilation movies that fixed all the complaints about the series certainly didn't hurt either. Interesting that we have shows like Transformers and G.I. Joe that were created as an advertisement for the toys, and here we have Gundam, which is a fairly serious war drama that was saved by the toys. In the wise words of Master Yogurt, merchandising. So with all the pretense and context out of the way, how's the actual show? Well, considering the fact that it's 42 years old, it actually is still very impressive. I think that what Gundam does incredibly well is set a tone. I mentioned it briefly before, but halfway through episode 1, one of the main character's entire family is blown up in front of her. It's shown in a very matter-of-fact and blunt manner, and played completely straight. This event illustrates one of the central points of Gundam as a franchise. War is terrible. I mean, I'm sure a lot of you have seen the Wow Cool Robot meme, and the dude who made that meme must have been a scholar, because it's definitely true. Despite Bandai making literally all the money from merch sales, Gundam has almost always been a show that strives to show the costs and horrors of war. At the end of the first episode of Mobile Suit Gundam, our main character, Amuro Ray, stabs an enemy mobile suit right in the cockpit, killing the pilot. The camera then holds on his shocked reaction. Killing someone isn't shown as something heroic or chivalrous in this series. It's usually a last resort, purely defensive or as a means to an end. Introducing the Principality of Xeon, a rebellious alliance of space colonies currently locked in a deadly one-year war with the Earth Federation. According to the opening text of MSG, half of humanity has already died. Say what you want about space fascists, but they are pretty efficient. You see, a little bit before the start of the series, Xeon dropped an entire space colony onto the Earth, killing half the population and causing major ecological disasters and shifts. Not to mention blowing up apparently 16% of the continent of Australia? Blimey. Now, both sides are locked in a bloody conflict that rages from space colonies to the Earth itself. Xeon has deployed its Zaku mobile suit, a revolutionary weapon that has helped to push the Federation to the edge of defeat. On Space Colony Side 7, the Earth Federation quickly develops a prototype mobile suit, the RX-78 Gundam. As the first episode opens, the very first shot is of the iconic Zaku-2 mobile suit in its singular red eye. As a Xeon scouting team quietly infiltrates the Space Colony Side 7, we are introduced to two of our main characters, Fraubo and Amuro Ray. Amuro is introduced in his underwear, having skipped breakfast to work on a very 70s looking sci-fi computer. This is the first character trait that we are introduced to with him. He's a hard worker, almost to a fault, as is illustrated by the fact that he completely missed orders to evacuate the colony. He's also incredibly proficient with tech, a trait I'm sure will come in handy later. Whoa, I just realized how far back I am from this camera. I won't use this camera very much because it's like shitty. Like, <laughs> Look how bad the motion is. But uh, yeah, I guess I'll just yell at you from back here for right now. Uh, forgive me if I skip around a bit while explaining the overarching plot. I don't want to spend a ton of time on the opening episodes, but the first 25 minutes of Mobile Suit Gundam introduces a bunch of like concepts, factions, and characters that I would really be doing a disservice to the show if I didn't talk about them a little bit in depth. We then cut to Amuro's father, Tem Ray, aboard the White Base a ship that appears to be designed to sell toys. In fact, even the Gundam looks like a toy. The show's backstory and setting are all super serious war drama stuff, but the show's titular mobile suit looks like something out of Transformers. Funnily enough, this was actually a decision made by Sunrise, as Tomino originally wanted the Gundam to be uniform gray. Seems like another case of corporate meddling with a creative, but in this case, it may have actually saved the franchise. 
Anyway, we catch up to Tem Ray, military scientist and engineer docking with Side 7, apparently on the run from a Xeon ship. I find it interesting that one of the first things Tem Ray says is that he designed the mobile suit so that, and I quote, we may be able to end this war without sending kids like you into battle. Mobile Suit Gundam wastes no time getting its message out, although, as we will see in the coming episodes, this quote is rebuffed with bitter irony time and time again. We then immediately cut to another important character, Char. Now before I even talk about who he is or what he's doing, let's get it out of the way. But I suppose that's what destiny is, isn't it? He's awesome, he's iconic, every Gundam series after this has to have a man with a mask. As we'll see with the original Mobile Suit Gundam, setting up a literal faceless villain to be one of the most interesting characters in the entire show is going to have a huge payoff. See, it is exactly as I predicted. So Shar has chased the Federation's new ship to Side 7, where he discovers the Federation's new mobile suit. The recon team gets a little ahead of themselves and starts causing all sorts of mayhem in an attempt to destroy this new weapon. In the confusion, our protagonist, Amuro, is searching desperately for his father and we get our first sense of scale with the Zaku in particular. I mean, this thing towers over a normal person, buildings, and trees. Even just the shell casings from its gun are as big as a car. While searching for his father, we see two Federation officers killed by the Zaku. This made me realize that, wow, maybe the show does actually deal with some dark content and isn't just Transformers-style toy bait. Almost immediately after this, the Xeon mobile suit opens fire on a group of civilians. This is the third time so far in this video that I've brought this up, and I think it's because it's the perfect example of the tone that Mobile Suit Gundam sets out for itself. We have two characters, Amuro and Frau, witness unprovoked brutality committed by Xeon mobile suits. And this isn't shown off screen or just mentioned offhand. Frau gets blown into the air and her parents die. She then has to abandon their dead bodies and run to the spaceport. It's crazy. This is a turning point for Amuro, who, with tears in his eyes, runs to the Federation's prototype mobile suit, the Gundam, with manual in hand and climbs inside. The weapon his father helped develop to save children from fighting in wars is now being piloted by a 15-year-old civilian. The first episode concludes with Amuro piloting the Gundam, fighting off two Zaku units. Yes, this is still the first episode. A lot happens, trust me. After slicing the first Zaku in half, causing a huge detonation that literally blows a hole in the side of the colony, Amuro is forced to target his opponent's cockpit directly in order to avoid further destruction. Also, blink and you'll miss it, but when this Zaku explodes, Amuro's dad and another military officer are just like sucked out into space. It's a shot that's only a few seconds long and you can totally miss it, but it really illustrates the stakes that even a small battle in the Gundam universe can have. After stabbing the second Zaku's cockpit and killing the pilot, the camera holds on Amuro's shocked face. Killing isn't shown as something heroic or gallant here, it's a last resort. And the weight of that action will have influence over Amuro's entire character arc from here on out. The Gundam is loaded onto the white base along with the surviving Side 7 civilians and the ship takes off under the command of Ensign Bright Noah. During the attack, most of the crew was injured or killed, including the captain. With only six months of military experience, 19-year-old Bright is the highest-ranking officer. This becomes a core part of Mobile Suit Gundam. The crew of the White Base are young and inexperienced, with many of them being civilians. Even after escaping Side 7, the ship is put into immediate danger by Shar and his Red Zaku, with only Amuro piloting the Gundam to defend them. Even after fighting off the Xeon soldiers, killing another person in the process. Is that there? A, a Zaku suit destroyed with only one shot? I'll pay you back for this. Amuro and the White Base make it to the Federation base Luna 2, only to be detained. Amuro and a lot of the crew working on the White Base are civilians, which is kind of a big no-no. Turns out, even if the circumstances force this situation to arise, allowing civilians to not only see but pilot top-secret prototype weapons is kind of a big deal. 
During their detention though, the power of the base is knocked out and the crew of the White Base are released and allowed to leave. Amuro then battles Shar in space once again before becoming the first mobile suit pilot to survive re-entry into Earth's atmosphere using the Gundam's heat film. And that's the end of the first five episodes of Mobile Suit Gundam. Honestly, the pace is almost light speed, and that will slow down as the show moves forward throughout the story. Because of Shar's attack during the events of episode 5, the white base is forced to land off course on Earth, deep in Xeon territory. Shar chases them to Earth, meeting up with Captain Garma Zabi, a military commander who went to officer school with him. Throughout the next five episodes, Garma attempts to destroy the White Base in an attempt to gain glory within the Xeon forces. As the conflict carries on, Garma attacks the White Base and fails a handful of times before the following happens. <laughs> hey Garma, do you read me? Blame this on the misfortune of your birth. What? Misfortune? That's right. Char, you're not saying that- You were indeed a very good friend to me. Don't take it personally. You can thank your father for this. <laughs> Char, you- You double-crossed me, Char! <laughs> wow, so Char just became an incredibly interesting character. I mean, he had this moment in episode 2 where him and Sayla appear to know each other, but other than that, he's kind of just been a standard villain so far. At this point, we start to see one of the things that Gundam portrays that makes it so ahead of its time. PTSD. Over the next few story arcs, Amuro starts to suffer from the effects of fatigue and the mental stress of combat. And while Amuro almost always shows enthusiasm for the act of piloting the Gundam in the moment, there are times throughout the first 25 episodes that he straight up refuses to pilot it and even goes AWOL. Now, if I were a kid watching this, I probably wouldn't sympathize with our lead. I mean, who wouldn't want to pilot a 60 foot tall robot? But now, as someone in their 30s, I understand. Amaro didn't choose this situation, his father's in the military, but he's just a civilian and only 15 at that. And while this reluctant pilot trope has become a rather large part of mecha anime in general, it's done really well here. It's realistic, and the fact that Tomino explores this aspect in any depth back in 1979 deserves credit. Episode 13, Coming Home, is a major turning point for the development of our lead. The white base takes a rare day to rest, while Amaro takes the core fighter to a small town nearby. It happens to be the town where he was born before his mother and father split up. Not having seen his mother in years, Amaro decides to search for her and makes his way to their old house, only to find it deserted and taken over by drunken Federation soldiers that, by the way, act like huge dicks to him for no reason. Well, hey there, what's the matter? What's wrong, little boy? Miss your mommy? <laughs> After leaving the house in a rage, Amaro runs into an older woman who used to know him as a child, and she tells him that his mother is helping at a refugee camp. Unfortunately for Amaro, their reunion is cut short by Xeon soldiers from a nearby base searching for suspicious people. Where's that noise coming from? Hmm? I don't know. I'm 89 years old. In what is probably one of the most intimate examples of violence that we've seen so far, Amaro shoots one of the soldiers from his hiding spot and pursues a second soldier with his sidearm. Seeing her son take a life so easily causes Amaro's mother to basically disown him in this moment. And it's not until the white base arrives later and Bright explains that they're all alive only through Amaro's efforts that she understands. This episode is poignant because it ends with a true turning point for our main character. Amaro ends episode 13 by deciding to become a soldier and committing to the white base and the Gundam, saluting his own mother and turning away as she collapses in tears, mourning the death of her son's innocence. He can truly never return home because it will just never be the same. Boy, what a fun episode of a children's cartoon show about giant robots. I guess that's what makes Mobile Suit Gundam such a standout for not only its time, but for animation in general. This is a mature story, and Tomino pulled no punches. 
So now, with Amuro deciding to really apply himself as the Gundam pilot, he stops doing the reluctant pilot, getting the damn robot Shinji trope that everyone loves to hate. However, that doesn't mean he's a stoic professional soldier now by any means. In fact, Amuro makes just about the most selfish and immature decision he possibly could at this point in the story. In an engagement with Xeon forces led by the certified beast and badass Ramba Rall, Amuro ignores orders to pilot the Gundam and instead launches in the gun tank. I know I haven't talked about the mobile suit designs very much, but the gun tank is pretty much what it sounds like. Half mobile suit, half tank, uh, it's pretty dumb looking. There's also the gun cannon, which is basically just a red Gundam with big cannons on its shoulders that has heavier armor. Both of these actually get a lot of use throughout the show, but the Gundam is almost always the main focus. Well, it turns out that ignoring orders to launch the Gundam was a bad idea because Ramba Rall had a brand new mobile suit. The Xeon Zaku 2 has gotten an upgrade to the badass looking but bizarrely named Goof. Amuro converts to piloting the Gundam and engages the Goof to a stalemate. Upon returning to the ship, Bright tells Amuro he's annoying and stupid and to listen to orders. Later on, Amuro overhears Bright and Mirai talking about relieving him of his duties as the Gundam pilot, which makes him cry and run away. In fact, he cries and runs away in the Gundam. For all the complaining that he's just a civilian that can't be forced to pilot the Gundam, it's the fact that after finally committing to being a soldier, being taken off the Gundam is what finally causes Amuro to snap. Hey there, gorgeous. <laughs> See, look, this is normally where you'd put like a sponsor, but I, I don't got one, so I'm going to sponsor myself. Uh, if you like what you see here, go ahead and check out my Twitch channel. Uh, I'll throw the link in the description where you'll see things like this. Who wants to live here? This is like an apocalypse all the time. You see that asshole down there? Yeah, look at him. Freak. He doesn't even have exposed rock nipples. Let's kill him. Sounds great. And maybe something like that. Damn, Isaac's strong. He, he can just stomp off people's limbs like, really quick. Oh, sick of power now. Oh my god! You little bastard! I hate you so much with your little face. And definitely a little of this. I'm so happy, my sweet dolly. Don't you ever get lost again. <laughs> anyway, I am live there a good amount when I'm not working, uh, so it's always a good time. We have a pretty active chat of a couple of regular people that are really fun to hang out with. And I would really appreciate seeing you there and uh, telling me you dropped by because you saw this Gundam video. So we'll see you in the chat and uh, thank you very much. So he leaves after becoming confident in his abilities and goes off into the desert to eat beans by himself. We see Amuro stew in a newly acquired self-confidence, which ultimately leads to him attacking a Xeon mining facility, which he believes to be the target of Odessa Day, the current Federation military offensive. Amuro destroys the facility with relative ease using the Gundam, only to find that this is one of hundreds of mining facilities. In fact, Amuro's actions have the opposite effect of what he had hoped, as the Xeon forces are now aware of an imminent attack on their main base and have put defenses on high alert. Running away once again, Amuro is tracked down by Frau, while wearing a cool cape and eating at a bar. Here he meets Rambaral, one of my favorite characters in Gundam. Impressed with Amuro's willingness to just shoot everyone with the gun hidden under his cloak, Rall lets him and Frau escape. While Fraubao returns to the white base, Amuro goes off on his own. After seeing two Zaku and the Goof flying overhead towards the white base, Amuro decides to intervene in the Gundam unable to let his friends face Rambaral alone. We then get one of my favorite fights in the show between Amuro's Gundam and Rambaral's Goof. It's framed like an intense samurai battle and ends with both pilots' cockpits exposed and Rambaral pushing molten metal out of the way with his bare hands. Again, this fight is pretty much a stalemate between the two pilots, with Rall informing Amuro that the only reason he can match Rall in combat is because of the power of the Gundam, not his own skill. 
On my first watch, I realized the pattern for almost every episode involved Amuro piloting the Gundam to defend the white base from Xeon attack. It's a pattern that seems like it would wear on you after a bit and become boring. However, Mobile Suit Gundam skirts this by making almost every combat encounter unique. One episode might have the Gundam fending off Zaku's while performing atmospheric re-entry, while another might have the white base crippled while fending off a boarding party while the Gundam does something else. Honestly, the amount of different combat scenarios shown in the first half of Mobile Suit Gundam are pretty impressive. And now we're at the halfway point of the show. This arc concludes with Captain Makuve betraying Rambaral and explicitly not sending him replacement mobile suits as ordered by Adder Thing that Mobile Suit Gundam does so well. There's infighting on both sides of the war, and Xeon being ruled by a familial dictatorship has so many players in the game that it can be hard to keep track of who's backstabbing who. It definitely makes a rewatch enjoyable. In the end, Ramba leading her to a run-in with Ramba Rall himself. Shockingly, Rall recognizes Sela and refers to her as Princess and says that he served under her father, Zeon Zum Daiku. Huh, well that's interesting, isn't it? I knew that Shar and Sela knew each other, but them being a prince and princess? I mean, that just throws another layer into the show that makes it much more spicy. In the end, Ramba Rall is injured after trading shots with Ryu and backed into a corner. He dies a soldier's death, leaping from a hole in the sand hatred. Begins with the lover and subordinate to Rambaral, Crowley Hamon, preparing for an attack on the white base. With the rest of Ral's forces desperate for revenge, they plan an attack designed to destroy the white base and the Gundam all at once. Filling the damaged Gallup attack ship with explosives, they plan to collide it with the White Base, which is still undergoing repairs from the previous battle, destroying both in the process. Having only one remaining Zaku-2, four fighter craft, and the Gallup, Hamon launches the attack. Aboard the White Base, Ryu is recovering from his wounds, and boy, he's kind of a tank, isn't he? I mean, it's not like he has a broken arm. The guy took a burst of machine gun fire to the chest and basically shook it off. He gets up and runs around the ship too, walking out of the infirmary and onto the bridge, even talking to Amuro in the brig and telling him that he thinks Bright is being too stubborn and putting Amuro back into solitary. Amuro, surprisingly, says he understands Bright's decision and isn't upset. We can see his development and experience of the last arc really coming to the forefront here. Hamon's lone Zaku attacks the white base from the rear causing the crew to scramble all the available mobile suits. Kai and Hayato launch the gun cannon and gun tank, but the assault has begun in full at this point and they can just barely hold on. Ryu lets Amuro out of the brig and tells him to pilot the Gundam and that he'll take full responsibility for letting him out. He then goes to assist Hayato in the gun tank, which is suffering from previous damage. Amuro launches the Gundam and attempts to engage the lone Zaku that's chopping the white base open with its heat axe. During this fight, he realizes that the Gallop isn't slowing down and is on a collision course with the White Base. Amuro then does one of the coolest moves in the show, flipping the Zaku into the air and throwing it into one of the attack crafts. Amuro grabs onto the Gallop in an attempt to slow it down, but is immediately attacked by Hamon in one of the fighter craft. She levels the beam cannon and is about to blast the Gundam when, out of nowhere, Ryu, piloting the core fighter, crashes into Hamon, saving the Gundam but killing both Hamon and himself. This is a powerful moment and a turning point for the crew and the show as a whole. As the episode ends on a beautiful shot of the landscape bathed in the light of a sunset, the crew mourns their fallen friend. Ryu was never a character that was front and center, but he was kind of the backbone of the white base, and a mentor figure to the other pilots. And the show doesn't pull a fast one either, Ryu's gone. It's in this moment that we see Bright show emotion for the first time and really open up on a personal level with his crew. And that pretty much ends the middle point of the show. Ever since the white base touched down on Earth, they were chased by Garma Zabi and then Ramba Rall and Hamon. Now, having defeated their pursuers at a high cost, the crew of the White Base really comes together as a unit of soldiers, not just a bunch of civilians whose hands have been forced. And what's next for the crew of the White Base, you might ask? Well, it's their first actual large-scale military engagement, the Battle of Odessa. 
Now that they have gotten rid of the last obstacle in their way and have also survived Captain Makuve's schemes, the White Base finally gets new orders, though not the ones they had hoped to receive. The White Base is to sneak behind enemy lines and attack Makuve's base from behind, and have no time to recuperate. The crew is still reeling from not only the death of Ryu, but also the loss of Lieutenant Matilda, who perished during the attack by Makuve. Yeah, that's not going to mess Amuro up any more than he already is. Matilda was an interesting character with a short run on the show. She showed up early on for a few episodes to resupply the white base and immediately captured the affection of Amuro. She then shows up to resupply white base again after they engage with Rambaral, and that's pretty much it. But to Amuro, it was another connection taken away by the war, and unfortunately, it won't be the last. While observing the Xeon base before the battle, Amuro and Sela, piloting the newly developed G-Armor, witness a Federation plane leaving the base. Thanks for dropping that off before blowing up, Matilda. We miss you already. Amuro and Sela follow the plane to the Federation battleship Big Trey, where Amuro tells General Elrin that there's a spy on board and shows him a photo as evidence. Elrin, being a giant moron, outs himself as the spy and threatens to kill Amuro, saying it won't matter because he's a general. His men then betray him because they were listening at the door and take him into custody. Amuro and Sela return to the battle to assist the Federation. Captain Makuve then retreats to space, losing the battle but having gained enough resources in his mining operation to keep the Xeon army running for another 10 years. The crew of the White Base then finally meet General Revel face to face. And this marks another turning point in the story of Mobile Suit Gundam. Up until the Battle of Odessa, the White Base and even the Federation in general seem to be on the ropes, barely scraping by by the skin of their teeth at times. But now they have completely kicked Captain Makuve's forces off the planet. The Federation is ready to go on the offensive. That means we're going back to space, baby. But first, the White Base has to go from Belfast, Ireland, to Jabiro Base in South America. It's a pretty good couple of episodes. Kai deserts, finds love, she's a spy, and then she gets yeeted off the side of the ship. Char's also back, so that's pretty cool. White Base arrives in Jabiro, a huge underground base in South America. Here we see for the first time that the Federation is building a mass production model mobile suit. Modeled after the original Gundam, these mobile suits, referred to as Jims, are the new backbone of the Federation army. The crew doesn't have much time to rest though, as Jabiro comes under attack by Xeon forces. Like I said, Shar is back in action now, and we haven't really seen him since he killed off Garma. The White Base is able to survive the attack and head for space with help from Lieutenant Woody, Matilda's ex fiance Once out of the atmosphere, the White Base is immediately thrown into the thick of things, acting as a decoy for the rest of the ships leaving Jaburo. The crew must leave two hours before the rest of the fleet and go in the opposite direction to lead away any would-be pursuers. Honestly, I think this episode is pretty good, but I noticed something near the end when Amuro is fighting off the Xeon Rickdom mobile suits. During the fight, Amuro almost seems to see the future, and his forehead flashes with light every time he maneuvers the Gundam. We can bring that up in more detail later, but let me just say, foreshadowing for how weird things are about to get. Finally, the Gundam and the White Base make it to the neutral space colony of Side 6. While on Side 6, the crew gets a little downtime, and we get to see a glimpse of what life is like for normal people not engaged in the war. Side 6's neutrality will become a small focal point for the theme of the next few episodes. We learn that Mirai is engaged to a man that works on Side 6, who actually turns out to be the DA. Multiple times throughout these couple of episodes, Mirai is given a chance to leave the White Base and live a normal life with her fiancé Cameron. Mirai and Cameron's romance was a thing of circumstance though and not love, and in the end Mirai turns down Cameron's offer to stay in Side 6, citing his willingness to hide away in a neutral colony instead of taking a side in the war. Amuro also has a run-in with someone from his life before the war. While shopping at night in Side 6, Amuro spots his father boarding a bus. He chases him and finally catches up to him, yelling out, and when his father turns to greet him he just asks, how's the Gundam working? 
Even Amuro is taken aback by his detached questioning. The last time we saw Tem Ray was all the way back in Episode 1 when he was sucked out into space. I assumed that he died and Amuro just knew he was missing, so for him to be so matter-of-fact and reserved is definitely strange. And then, as Amuro visits his father's shop in a local junkyard, it dawns on him. Tem Ray is suffering from brain damage due to oxygen deficiency, and it's Amuro's fault. He gives Amuro a piece of junk that will supposedly upgrade the Gundam, and Amuro takes his leave. This episode tackles a lot of tough subject matter. Amuro has now lost his father and his mother to different circumstances because of the war. And as this episode ends, it's the last time we see Amuro and his father together. So now our protagonist has basically lost his father, his mother is back on Earth and unreachable, and he has a distant relationship with everyone on the white base at best. He's probably closest to Sela at this point, but only because she pilots the G-Armor and the G-Fighter. Honestly, Amuro basically has almost nothing besides his position as the pilot of the Gundam. It's in this lost and vulnerable position that Amuro finds himself stuck in a rainstorm while driving through the countryside of Side 6. He takes cover near a house on a lake and observes a young woman. Both watch a bird flying over the water when the woman exclaims how sad before the bird perishes. Amuro is almost in transpire and talks to her for a moment. They have a simple conversation and the girl, named Lala, gets up and runs barefoot through a muddy field. Overall, the encounter is kind of strange and almost otherworldly, and I think the audience is supposed to feel similarly to Amuro, confused but also intrigued. Later, while driving back to the white base, Amuro gets stuck in a ditch and flags down another jeep that just happens to be driven by Lala and Shar. This is the first time our two rivals from either side of the war meet face to face. And while Amuro just has a feeling that this weird looking guy is Shar the Red Comet, you know, because he's wearing all red and has a big helmet and mask, Shar has no idea who he is. He helps Amuro get out of the ditch and they go on their way, a run-of-the-mill encounter for Shar, but an absolutely terrifying one for Amuro. Back on the white base, the crew is able to escape with the help of Cameron, who, with the inspiration of Mirai's words, covers the white base's escape. Amuro launches in the Gundam to defend the ship from a group of Rickdoms, and for the first time we see Amuro getting so good with the Gundam, he's predicting where enemy mobile suits will be and just destroying them with ease. After escaping from the Xeon forces that were waiting for them just outside of Side 6's neutral airspace, and meeting up with the rest of the Federation fleet, the White Base learns the target of their next operation, Space Fortress Solomon, a huge floating meteor that is the frontline base for Dozel Zabi's space attack force. Destroying or capturing this base would be a huge boon for the Federation, as it would cripple Xeon's ability to deploy troops throughout space. This is the first time we see a huge battle in all its destructive glory in Gundam. Solomon is called a fortress for a reason, and the Federation brought an entire fleet. Amuro in the Gundam is fighting on the front lines, and I think this episode is where we truly see what an amazing pilot he's become. As he counts down the Rick Doms that he's destroying left and right, nobody can touch Amuro. At this point, he's even outmatched Shar in combat ability. It's at this point that the Federation reveals its new, devastating weapon that has been hidden in the destruction of a nearby colony. The Solar System, which is basically a huge set of remote-controlled mirrors, allows them to harness the power of the sun and blow a huge hole in the main gate of Solomon, taking a chunk of the Xeon fleet with it. And wow, this is the first time we get like a sense of scale for how huge a weapon like this could be, and it's truly terrifying. We also get to see the perspective of Admiral Dozel Zabi, who's a big lug with a scar on his face. Honestly, Dozel seems to not be as bad as the other members of the Zabi family, like Giren. Oh, we'll get to him, just you wait. He also pilots a mobile armor called the Big Zam, and while it's short-lived, it's pretty awesome. Also, the name Big Zam might just be the best name for anything in Gundam. To illustrate the sheer power of Big Zam, we get a scene with Amuro listening to allied radio chatter straight out of a horror movie. 
In the end, it takes a combination of the Gundam and the G-Fighter piloted by Slegger Law. A character I did gloss over because he's only in a few episodes, but he's basically the same rank as Bright and kind of obnoxious. He does slap the shit out of Mirai though, so that's kind of something. To finally deal a finishing blow to the Big Zam. Slegger dies in the process, being ejected out into space, but Dozel gets a much more fitting end to his life. The man literally climbs on top of the wreckage of Big Zam and shoots at the Gundam with a machine gun. It's the most fitting thing for someone like Dozel Zabi to do. But in the end, he explodes like the rest. The defeat of Solomon is noted as a crushing blow to Zeon that they could not have prepared for. The death of an admiral and the destruction of such a huge fleet starts to bring the One Year War to its conclusion. A conclusion that will have far more loss of life than we see here. And it's between the Battle of Solomon and the final piece of the series that we actually get my favorite episode of the original Mobile Suit Gundam. Episode 36, The Duel in Texas. The White Base is on its way to meet up with the rest of the fleet after the Battle of Solomon. They're intercepted by Char Zanzibar, and a battle between Makuve's forces and the Gundam breaks out. Amuro dispatches the Rickdoms with ease, but then takes on Makuve himself in a custom-built mobile suit called the Gyan. During the battle, Makuve remarks that Amuro must be a new type to pilot the Gundam so well. This is actually one of the first times the word new type is spoken in the script, and I think it's pretty crazy that something that becomes so central to the plot is mentioned so offhandedly. Makuve lures Amuro inside the damaged space colony Texas, and the sequence where Amuro enters the space colony is some of my favorite stuff. The lighting and framing of the Gundam entering the hallways is almost like something out of a horror movie, and then we see the inside of the colony and it's basically a desert being dried out by damaged atmospheric processors. There's a final battle between Makuve and Amuro. Meanwhile, Shar and Layla are here, and it's it's really funny to see them rolling across the desert in a covered wagon with like a huge computer in the back measuring her brainwaves. It's just kind of weird. Uh, Shar and Lala observe Makuve struggle against Amuro, and Shar hops in his brand new Galgu to help out. The names in this show are just crazy sometimes. By the way, Shara's Gelgoog might be my favorite mobile suit in the series. It's huge and red and cool. I just love how it looks. Makuve gets super pissed that Shar interrupts the fight and tells him to back off. All while Lava watches from a nearby cliff. As Amuro strikes the killing blow on Makuve, Lava reaches out telepathically and tells him to stop, but it's already too late. I love this sequence. As soon as Lala is shown watching the battle, the music and visuals start to change. The soundtrack loses its normal fast-paced percussion and is overtaken by a low droning. The visuals become slightly abstract, and Lala's voice reaches Amuro through his own thoughts. It's a really cool segment, and we get a ton more stuff like this in the next few episodes. We also learn that not only are Char and Sela siblings, they're the children of Zeon Zoom Daikun, the heirs to Zeon's original founders. They were hidden away after their father was presumably poisoned by the current monarch, Degwin Zabi. While Sela grew up in hiding and ended up joining the Federation by chance after an attack on Side 7, Kazval took on the name Char and joined the Zeon army, rising through the ranks to take revenge on the Zabi family. I have to say, I love this side plot in Gundam. I hesitate to even call it a side plot because it just gives the One Year War such a tragic edge. And hey, Char's done a fairly good job so far, to be honest. He offed Garma in like episode 10, and now Dozel's gone too. In the end, similarly to how Amuro decided to become a soldier instead of staying with his mother, Char decides to finish the job he started instead of leaving with Sela. Plus, now he has a much more lofty goal than just taking revenge. Char now wants to use Lala's abilities as a new type to create a new future for humanity. You see, his father, Zeon Zoom Daikun, created Zeon around the belief that one day, humans would take the next step in evolution, and only by embracing that step could we truly end war and strife. The Zabi family has perverted that message and basically turned Zeon into a bunch of space Nazis. 
In fact, in episode 39, Degwin Zabi just straight up gets tired of how hungry for war Giran is as Supreme Commander of the Army and literally compares him to Hitler. We've reduced the human population. We will then maintain these numbers with the superior races. It's the only way man can finally attain everlasting peace. And it can only be done by controlling people through the Zabi family dictatorship. Uh, Giran, are you familiar with Adolf Hitler? Yes, a dictator, completely out of touch with the rest of the world. You seem to be following in his footsteps. Is that so? Hitler's follower has managed to lead the nation to a dictatorship. Together with Cassilia? Yes. Just as with the Federation, a democracy will only promote weakness. People will only end up destroying each other. And Giran's just like, yeah, that's pretty rad. And then later he goes on a big tirade about how they need to secure space for the superior race. It's literal space Nazi stuff, and they really hammer it home here. And by the way, I kind of actually appreciate Degwin as a character here. It would have been really easy to make him an evil dictator, but instead he comes off as more of an opportunistic politician, a man not ready to throw away his entire country over winning this increasingly violent war. And so Degwin actually goes to meet with General Revel to pursue peace. Meanwhile, Shar is training Lala to use the mobile armor Elmeth even more effectively. She destroys two enemy cruisers in her first sortie, really putting those new type powers to good use. Amaro, on the other hand, is having the Gundam upgraded with a magnetically coated armor techno babble that will increase the Gundam's reaction speed. During the episode, Shar, Lala, and Amaro come face to face in a space battle, and I have to say the theme that they give Lala and the general feel of the music and visuals since new types have been introduced are so totally different, sometimes even otherworldly. I love it. Ultimately, the Xeon forces retreat and everyone lives another day. But not for long, because in episode 41, titled A Cosmic Glow, more people die in one episode than we've seen so far in the entire show. With the white base still on its way to the rendezvous point with the rest of the fleet, Char launches mobile suits once again in an attempt to catch them. In the ensuing battle, we get a bunch of amazing imagery and music as Amaro goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with Char and Lala. It's obvious at this point that Amaro outmatches Char several times over in combat ability. His new type powers are just developing too rapidly. Sela also enters the battle in the G-Fighter, leading to several close calls. Finally, as Amaro is about to strike a final blow on Char's badly damaged Gelgoog, Lala pushes him out of the way and takes the brunt of the attack, being inadvertently killed by Amaro, who then has a full-scale 2001 A Space Odyssey style breakdown. Char is also mad because he had just planted a kiss on Lala like five minutes ago, and as far as grooming psychics to be super soldiers goes, Char is definitely the king. All you can really do for the end of this episode is watch it unfold. It's so cool and totally not what I expected during the first 75% of Mobile Suit Gundam's run. I think the introduction of the more metaphysical aspects into the series really helps it keep feeling fresh late into the show. It certainly sets it apart in my mind, and I'm sure this mix of hard sci-fi and mystical overtones help to contribute to Gundam's eventual popularity. Amaro says something that really stuck with me after dealing that killing blow. I've done something terrible, I've done something I can never take back. And he sheds tears over this woman that he'd only known for a fleeting moment in time. But when you consider that Amaro and Lala are the very first of their kind, two people that could be the next step in human evolution, and can telepathically understand everything about each other, and one of them just kill the other? Well, fuck man, how do you even deal with that? And Amaro basically just doesn't deal with it, because he goes back to the white base and is like, everything's fine, when he's very, very obviously not fine. But before the white base can even deal with that, they witness General Revel's fleet, which they have almost finally reached the engulfed in a white light. Despite Degwin Zabi meeting with General Revel for peace talks, Giran Zabi fires the Solar Ray a giant version of the Federation's solar system weapon, directly at the Federation's main fleet. This just devastates two-thirds of the Federation fleet, hundreds if not thousands of people disintegrate in the attack, including General Revel and Degwin Zabi. 
Yep, Supreme Commander Giren Hitler himself kills his own dad and basically assumes control of Zeon. Luckily, he could only fire the solar ray once because of the blast damage of the solar ray itself. The final two episodes of the series are an all-out battle between the remaining Federation forces and the final line of defense for Zeon, the space fortress A Boaku. Unfortunately for Giren Zabi, he didn't realize that the Federation had split its forces up into separate fleets, and also Kaecilia learned about the peace talks. After questioning Giren about if he knew that Degwin would perish in the Solar Ray attack, she decides that he's way too much of an asshole and just shoots him through the back of the head. Man, this scene really encapsulates what I love about Gundam so much. The death of Giren is so unceremonious, he literally just dies and then floats into a window and bumps all around the ceiling as Kaecilia takes command. It's so matter-of-fact, I love how Gundam presents it. It doesn't ever rely on the main character to make things happen, it really makes the universe seem alive. At the same time, Amuro, who's desperately fighting to protect the White Base during the battle, and Shar, still wanting revenge for Lala's death, launches in a new prototype mobile suit, the Zeon. Shar and Amuro battle it out, both getting damaged in the process. The White Base is even shot down, landing on the outside of the Space Fortress. We see the Zhang get reduced to nothing but its head, and the Gundam, in a shocking turn of events, has its arm and then even its head blown off. Shar lures Amuro into the interior of Aboaku, where the Gundam is reduced to basically nothing but a torso, and they're forced to fight man to man. Shar, figuring that Amuro, while great at piloting the Gundam, would be easy to kill in person, becomes locked in physical combat with him. And at some point in their duel, they find swords too, which is pretty cool, and no, it's not explained where they came from. Both Amuro and Shar end up getting injured, with Shar's face mask protecting him from certain death. Sela intervenes in the fight and convinces both that they're not truly enemies, and it's the Zabi family who are to blame for everything. While Amuro escapes via the core fighter, the entire base begins to collapse around him. Shar, on the other hand, is the most badass thing I think I've seen in anime. Knowing that Kaecilia would try to escape the losing battle, he grabs a fucking bazooka and flies up to her ship with his jetpack stopping to shoot her in the face through the window. It's amazing and I honestly cannot believe that this show has this scene in it, it's just too good. Amaro then escapes the base using his telepathic powers to lead the crew of the White Base to safety. One of the last things we see in the show is the crew fleeing in lifeboats as the iconic ship goes down in flames, but they're safe because Amaro called out to them. And in the final moments, Amaro realizes what he had to fight for the whole time. While he lost his father, is distant from his mother, saw friends and comrades killed before his eyes, the crew of the White Base has become his family and his home. And I think having the original Mobile Suit Gundam end on a hopeful note of Amuro reaching out towards the people that mean so much to him is well deserved. And that, my friends, is the original Mobile Suit Gundam. We learn that shortly after the battle, Zeon and the Federation form a peace treaty. And while not everything is tied up into a nice resolution, Mobile Suit Gundam feels like a tight package, even after being cut down by 10 episodes. The series had a vision of loss, the futility of war, the cost of human ambition, and ultimately hope for the future. It's not always the most beautiful show, it doesn't have the best pacing or the most impressive animation, even for its time, but it had vision, and it had a story to tell and it must have told it well enough because there's about 30 sequels to watch now. Next time on Mobile Suit Zeta Gundam, will you be able to survive? <laughs>